Well, hi everyone. A very warm welcome. It's been a little while. If you can work out the relevance of this music to today's discussion and what I think about it, then I'm sure you'll think of some sort of bonus prize. But uh, maybe I'll play that again at the end. Okay, enough of that. Marius, we should start. Let's be serious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, good morning to everyone on, uh, on, on uh, our Game Changers series. I mean, Colin, I think uh, we've been doing this for around 18 months. Um, Colin Isles is uh, our facilitator for this series. Um, Colin is the founder of Innovation Catalysts and working with uh, companies like ourselves to be braver and to think about how do we um, grow our business and our thinking exponentially. Um, the objective um, of this <clears throat> game, uh, game Changer series is really our contribution as Cybrant to just increase knowledge around certain topics. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, just a contribution for us to think together in terms of things that's relevant to the market going forward. And then today, um, <clears throat> we've got our guest is Monica Singer. Uh, so Monica has been in the industry for many, many years. She was the founder of Straight and the CEO of that business, which was obviously a <clears throat> major um, achievement and accomplishment in your life, Monica. And uh, she's now the Africa lead for consensus. Um, and a consensus is obviously it's a business that's focusing on blockchain um, with various applications globally. Um, and <clears throat> Monica, you and your team have gained much experience on blockchain, and I think the practical impl you know, implementation of, of blockchain, um, you know, I think it's been something that a lot of people struggled with and wondered about, and lots of speculation of what the impact of it all is going to be, and I personally think sometimes a lot of confusion between blockchain and cryptocurrencies and all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, but you've been leading this space now for um, the last number of years, eh? And uh, so we look forward to, to get some of your opinions with, with Colin on the talk. So um, with that, over to you, Colin, and to thank you for everyone that's joining us, whether it's in the afternoon or the, in the morning, or people that may sit in other uh, parts of the globe. So um, thank you for joining, and I look forward to hearing more from you, Monica. Thank you. And thank you very much, Marius, for the intro and a warm welcome to everyone that's dialed in and, and they've joined us. Monica, let's let's start um, a few years back because I think, I mean, we've called this series Game Changers. And I think it's worth just thinking that not only are you involved in a technology that is changing the game, but you were a game changer way back um, when you actually went in and started mm -hmm. straight and ran straight for many, many years. Um, can you just quickly talk about um, that progression, you know, what straight is, just in case anyone doesn't know, but how you've gone from this really traditional business and why you've stepped out into something which is really the bleeding edge of technology? So uh, 25 years ago, they, I was asked to transform the South African financial markets from paper-based to electronic. So if you were trading shares in 1995, you would have got an actual piece of paper with your name as your proof of ownership of shares in the stock market. At that time, there were only 4,000 trades a day. By the time I left straight, we were doing around 350,000 trades a day, just on equities. We also were doing the, the clearing and settlement of um, money markets and bonds. So it was a very successful story that needed to be told because the world was categorized in South Africa as one of the worst emerging markets in the world for operational and settlement risk. So um, the, the ability to dematerialize the shares, to bring uh, electronic payments so that we have delivery versus payment that is simultaneous, final, irrevocable, all that was needed. And we had to create what is called the central securities depository. What is straight, the company I created, it's simply the company that knows every single trade that everybody's doing, and then acts as the central intermediary or the brokers, the custodian banks, the, the JSC, the central bank, the banks. And therefore, it's able to say, OK, these are the trades that took place. Are the shares there? Is the cash there? Yes. Send an instruction to the central bank to settle the cash. Once instruction comes back saying cash settle, then the transfer of ownership takes place. So can you see that straight keeps 
the record of ownership of investors, it's centralized and has many, many, many layers of intermediary. There were two things that I wanted to achieve in my 20 years as CEO besides the things that I did achieve. The things I did not achieve was, for example, that I wanted the issuer to be able to see real time who's buying and selling shares. That's impossible because straight actually doesn't keep the name of the investors, it keeps the nominees. So we don't know who are the investors, so we cannot give that to the issuers. And therefore, all the intermediaries keep that information and we can provide that information to the issuers, but not real time. Then I wanted to give the ability to the investors to have in one um, screen, the ability to see all their holdings real time, no matter which intermediaries they were working with which is impossible because each intermediary gives their own record, different technologies, and therefore you cannot have that ability. So just imagine after trying for so long, fighting for so long to achieve this. In 2015, I read for the first time Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, Creating Bitcoin. And I recommend that everybody attending this webinar reads the white paper. I, I started crying because it could have never occurred to me in a million years that the solution for financial markets is not centralized, is not reliance on all these intermediaries, which includes the banks, the auditors, the lawyers, everybody that we as society have outsourced our trust. So when I read the Bitcoin white paper that talks about peer-to-peer, -peer, where the investor, the buyer and the seller can talk to each other real time, all transparent, open source, in a technology called blockchain, which, what is blockchain in a nutshell? It's a ledger, remember my childhood accountant, so for me, ledgers are everything that I've been trained to work with all my life. So, so now I read that the ledger can be, doesn't have to be in silos, doesn't have to be in an Excel spreadsheet, it's going to be recorded in the internet. In the internet? When I created Straight, they didn't allow me to use the internet for transactions of value. I had to use SWIFT, which is a private permission ecosystem that is only allowed to, uh, to be used by banks and other financial uh, intermediaries. So imagine that now Satoshi says, no, 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 all these intermediaries, all these private permission networks don't be, are not needed. I remember that the Bitcoin white paper was written as a result of the financial crisis. So clearly, whoever Satoshi is, was very angry with what had happened to the world and said, how do we prevent financial crises into the future? And the way to prevent crises, corruption, fraud, it's really to use the internet, but using this technology that once you do these journal entries, they cannot be amended. So, so just, Satoshi invented what is called cryptography, which is a mathematical formula that prevents anybody from amending the records, from cheating. And then in auditing, I'm a trained auditor, in auditing, we have the concept of the four eye principle. Just imagine that so she says, you don't need four eyes. You need many, many, many eyes because everybody's going to see the ledger at the same time. So just imagine that what he was saying is that in future, instead of your, the records of the bank being held by the bank and only the auditors of the bank can see those accounts, not even real time, imagine that in future, every transaction will be transparent and visible to everybody. And this is exactly, that vision is what we are living today in the decentralized finance world, where you can see real time, everything that's going on. Now, it cannot be amended, but the Bitcoin um, protocol, you can see real time, who's buying, who's selling, Ethereum, the same. So, do you understand that that vision of uh, Satoshi in, that he produced the paper in 20, 2008, and it's now real and, and the evolution, because that paper started to try to promote one currency for the world to prevent all these issues that we have with foreign exchange, with remittances, with the bank controlling your money. That paper said, you can control your own money. You will deal directly with whoever you want to deal you don't need to go by a bank. It's peer to peer, and you will hold that information under your control, and you will only share it when you want to share. Not anymore by a 
Facebook or Google or Apple or Amazon. And therefore, as we know, the Web 2.0 social media companies, for example, have abused that um, information against us in many instances. And therefore, we now say there's a new evolution of the web, of the internet, not only to be able to record transactions of value, but it's evolving to become to empower the individual to look after themselves. Let's be honest, Colin, not everybody wants to look after themselves. Most people say, I don't want to look after my own money. I want to employ a trusted third party that they can look after me. But the big difference is that you can then outsource, let's say to a financial advisor, to a bank, to a broker, but you will still be able to have your own information real time so when on a Friday night you have nothing else to do, you can check, you know, that your financial advice is not cooking the books. You know, hopefully this type of records will prevent a matter from telling you that he's investing the money in the stock market and he's actually not doing that. Because if we start using this technology, it will become very transparent as to what are the journal entries that are taking place and therefore ultimate. We want to protect the world as citizens of the world to say, not only are we empowering you to have your own records, we empowering you to protect your own record. And therefore, you know, we can talk about remittances, for example, we can talk about so many use cases that came about because of what Satoshi said in the white paper. So this evolution of thinking is happening very fast. Why? Because remember, most of it is open source and all everything is happening in the internet. So here you've got people from all over the world participating in this technology and creating huge amounts of innovation. If I tell you at Consensus, I've been there with them for five years, which we are the biggest blockchain company in the world, the amount of uh, innovation that I have seen in five years will blow you away. Um, well, let's get, let's get into that, Monica, because yeah. um, that's exactly where I wanted to start. I mean, the last time I spoke to you was, I think it was probably about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. And at that point in time, there was a lot of excitement. We had Bitcoin, I think it was at 60 odd thousand dollars a coin. We had, um, was it Coinbase, which had just listed on the stock market and had been mm -hmm. valued at something like $85 billion, which is at that point in time, probably the biggest exchange in the world by valuation, outsizing uh, the Nasdaq and the London Stock Exchange and anywhere else that you could go and look at. And since then, it's been a complete bloodbath. Um, there's been a number of big frauds which have lost hundreds of millions across different uh, models. We've seen, you know, a drop in the price of coins down to sub, you know, twenty thousand dollars. I think when we look at uh, Coinbase, that's probably somewhere around fourteen or fifteen billion. So it's not small, but it's <laughs> a lot smaller than it was. And clearly, there's lots of people that have been diving out of the markets. Are you still as excited and positive about the potential of Bitcoin as that conversation we had a year and a half back, or of? Has your confidence been dented slightly? Okay, so first of all, just to clarify that my passion has increased, not diminished, because we need to separate cryptocurrencies from blockchain solutions. And what we've seen is the fluctuation in cryptocurrencies, and there's been tons of speculation. Just remember, in the same way that traditional financial markets are driven by fear and greed, the same applied to cryptocurrencies. There are hundreds of um, new cryptocurrencies. You know, some of them are absolute rubbish, but it's um, just remember that the intention was never to, um, to speculate. The intention was truly to create something better for the world. So for example, if it's the gas that you use is what you use to pay to use the ecosystem. So it was never intended to speculate. It's never intended to be it's not intended to be the security. It's really, it's a, we call it ultrasound money because it can be gas that you pay to use the ecosystem. It can be an asset that you use to earn uh, income. You know, it's called staking. Um, it, uh, and it can be an, um, uh, an asset class in many ways. So, so let's not get confused between cryptocurrencies and blockchain solutions. And let's also not get confused between the evolution of the internet, which we now call Web 3.0, which achieves something marvelous, which is the decentralization of the information. 
it, it achieves the ability to create um, you know, virtual reality, technology, interoperability. It's, it's one of the pillars of the fourth industrial revolution. So if you have a look at how artificial intelligence, internet of things, big data and blockchain, they all come together in forming technology solutions for the betterment of the world. And it completely changes the behavior because now as people start understanding how this new internet works, they will start saying, how do I empower myself to be able to be financially independent without having to require um, the use of an intermediary? So, so more than ever, what I predicted five years ago when I left Stride, you know, I said, why did I leave Stride? Your question. Because I saw that the world will change again. Like in the same way that I had to change the world from paper to electronic, I said, wait a second, from centralized, the world will move to decentralized and straight is the mother of all centralized institutions. Mm -hmm. So why See? do you get a, a, a company like Straight when you can go from buyer to seller real time? You don't need a, a, an RBT. The irony of your move is not lost on me. <laughs> Look, two more, two more things on the currency side before moving across into this DeFi and DAOs, because those are fascinating. But in our last conversation, I said, there's two things that stand out for being reasons why I don't know if Bitcoin would work or any of the mm -hmm. currencies. One is obviously it's killing the planet because of the massive amount of energy that's being used. And the second is the um, potential for regulators to step in and, and try to go and stamp it out. Has anything changed that you've seen in, in both of those spaces? Uh, first of all, I can write just a, a lecture on uh, arguing against that argument which is fear, uncertainty, and deceit, that Bitcoin uses too much electricity. That, let's park it for another debate. It's not true, okay? We can have another debate, but obviously I think we're interested in the big merge. Okay, so Bitcoin, uh, please don't carry on saying that it's bad for the environment, blah, 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 because I can show you all the numbers, all the literature that shows that most of the Bitcoins have been mined in areas where it's natural resources, like in Iceland, they're using the volcanoes. So Salvador is going to use volcanoes. In China, they're using a hydroelectric. So the, the sources of energy are natural sources of energy that are being not, not being used for other reasons, and therefore it's helping the environment, actually, because you use some uh, for something good. You know, in some areas, they're using it to, uh, you know, you mine the Bitcoin, and then your house gets warm up because of the electricity you're using, but it's heating the house. So that's for another debate. What we have seen this year is that Ethereum, when you remember, Ethereum was created in 2015, and it was based on similar principles to the Bitcoin ecosystem, but with the added functionality of smart contracts. Now, this year we had what is called the merge. What did the merge achieve? It took Ethereum from proof of, of, of work, which is the one that requires a lot of electricity, to uh, record the transactions. It moved to proof of stake that doesn't use electricity. It uses, um, you know, staking of ETH. Whoever has the most ETH at hand to play the game will have the right to win uh, and therefore write in the ledger of ETH, Ethereum, the transaction. So it's not electricity. It's uh, reduced the use of electricity by 99.9%. .9%, and therefore we are seeing an evolution of other layer ones that are saying, okay, maybe Bitcoin is, you know, it's got a bad rap because people are saying that it's bad for the environment and, you know, with environmental social governance, we need to be more careful, blah, blah, blah. And now we have a new layer one that has now moved completely out of that electricity intense use to something that doesn't use electricity. So that's okay. a major evolution. So that's one evolution. Um, what about the evolution or, or what we're hoping is the support from the regulators here in South Africa, for example, the regulators are starting to step in and get more involved in, in crypto and every country is going down a different route. Are you seeing net favorites for, for crypto or is it sort of net uh, negative in terms of when you look at the different jurisdictions? Yeah, you know, South Africa declared crypto a financial instrument. So that is amazing. Because that, uh, that means that we don't need to write new legislation for how cryptocurrencies will be accounted for. The other um, amazing change that took place only a month ago 
was the Financial Accounting Standards Board in America had not given us any guidance or the guidance that was available was actually pathetic because they treated uh, cryptocurrencies as intangibles. And intangibles, you can only write them down, but you cannot write them up, which is ridiculous because cryptocurrencies fluctuate in value. And therefore, if you have a, a large holding like MicroStrategy that has a large holding on Bitcoin, imagine them at year end having to write down now that the price has been depressed, write it down, and then never again being able to write it up. So for the first time, FASB has now agreed that this technology, this cryptocurrency, is a, it's, it's able to be measured at a fair value. What is fair value? At year end, you say, okay, what is the market value today? And then I will recognize it in terms of what the market value is today. So you can write it up or write it down, which that makes much more sense than the previous pronouncement. So that gave clarity to the auditors to know how to recognize these cryptocurrencies in the balance sheet, which that the law being amended to recognize it as financial instrument. All of this is absolutely positive because if you are an institution, you want to know, you know, how you're going to recognize it in your balance sheet, how you're going to audit it, how is the regulators going to treat it. So you cannot bring money from the pension funds into crypto unless you know that it's been approved by the regulators. So the next debate that I want to see evolving in South Africa is, you know, we have this regulation 28 that tells pension funds how they can invest their money. And I really find it quite ridiculous that they actually said pension funds cannot invest in crypto because we have seen, I can show you the numbers that the, the, that is what we call it as asynchronicity types of investment. What does it mean? You invest very little in crypto, which gives you, because of the fluctuation, it gives you the right to the opportunity to increase the value much rapidly than if you invest on shares in the JSE. So this um, obligation to, uh, to invest mostly pension money in the JSE has actually been at the detriment of investors in South Africa. Only recently have they liberated Regulation 28 to expand the investments in foreign, in foreign uh, stock. But that was also quite limited in terms of the Regulation 28 which we have seen pension funds have actually deteriorated over the years because of that uh, silly requirement that was very protected of the JC, but not protected of the investor. So in future, Colin, I want a world where the investors, uh, and you know, in America, I don't know if you know, in America, in order to invest on, on uh, stocks, if you want to buy stocks directly, you have to prove that you have, a, a, you're a high net individual. Imagine that only the rich can invest in the stock market. Why? So can you see how this beautiful technology is now enabling even the young generation, the 20 year olds, to create wealth for themselves independently from um, intermediaries and independently from banks and government. And they can access this technology from wherever they are. And that's what I want to see. I want to see a world where you can have the choice. If we have free will, why can I not have free will if I want to invest my money? And if I lose it, it's my problem. Like we saw this year, we had a terrible collapse of one of the most. Well, I, think, I think that's the, but the important thing there, Monica, is that you're saying that we've got lots of uh, positives that have happened over the last 12 or 18 mm. you know, months. You've got governments and regulators starting to recognize it which makes mm. life easier because as you said it starts the debate for pension funds and other asset managers to actually fully engage and fulfill their own uh, requirements it gives it the stamp of validity for the retail market to get involved and start investing we have some big solves in terms of uh, moving away from high energy production so that it's available to transact there's also speed that's coming through to allow these transactions to happen uh, faster there's obviously the smart. I mean, there seems to me there's so many um, positives that are coming through. Mm. This feels like a thing that isn't going to go away. As a, as a as a quick summary, <laughs> I think there's too there's too many uh, stakeholders who are now too advanced in this that um, even I've got to be a, <laughs> starting to appreciate that this thing is here for for good. A hundred percent. And 
talking about um you know, so I just wanted to, to finish that, though. So, so okay. the real mark of this thing becoming um, kind of permanent is, in my mind, when we start to see stable coins and government-backed coins being released. Has there been much movement in that space as well? Huge. Let me tell you the story. <laughs> no, that is fascinating. What's, what's me... the summary? Oh, no. The su- <laughs> Do I talk too much? <laughs> so, so well, we've only got, I think... got 35 minutes left, and there's still quite a okay, few questions okay. I know, okay, okay, I'll carry up, but this is very important. 2018, I went around the world virtually, and I spoke to so many central banks, and I said, guys, listen, I can see adoption of crypto coming. If the the world moves into adoption of crypto, what's going to happen with the use of fiat and your controls over monetary policy? They dismissed me. They said, go away. Nothing's going to happen. Crypto is just a fact. Really? Until Facebook, remember, came up with that stable coin called Libra. And then the central banks freaked out saying, oh my God, Facebook, there's 2.3 billion users. Imagine if all of them moved to Libra, what's gonna happen with the fiat currencies? So that's when the whole explosion of central bank research started taking place. Then the Bank of International Settlements formed all these incredible research hubs. It's fascinating. Every day, you could just specialize on central bank digital currencies because every day there's a new central bank issuing a new paper, a new proof of concept, a new uh, iteration of how these CBDCs are going to be used. And I can tell you that the crypto maxis hate CBDCs, but I love them. You know why I love CBDCs? Because it's a liability on the central bank. For the first time, we're going to have money. Put it on mute. You carry. Okay. So, so for the first time, we're going to have central bank liabilities, central bank backing this money. Remember the money that you put in the bank is a deposit. They give you an IOU. If that bank goes under, your money's gone. And we have had too many experiences in South Africa and around the world of bank failures. So, commercial bank money, we always know, is not the same as central bank money. That's why one of the key principles of straight, for example, of financial markets is that the transactions in the stock market must settle in central bank funds, not commercial bank funds. So now the, the, the one thing that has happened is that the CBDCs could, could replace many of the functions of the banks. So what the banks are doing now saying, wait a second, we don't want to be displaced. So central banks are coming together and creating their own stable coin. We have, for example, JP Morgan, very advanced. They created what's called the Onyx. And the Onyx is a stable coin that they use internally for all their transactions, because as you know, they're one of the biggest um, you know, correspondent banks in the world. Therefore, they deal with all the currencies around the world. So they created this Onyx, which is a stable coin for them to use and facilitate um, you know, low cost uh, speed of settlement, blah, blah, blah. But now they are incredibly um, new developments that are taking place, which is really the whole debate on DeFi. And DeFi is truly the one that is going to change the world. So just park central bank digital currencies, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, and integration of all these new forms with each other. Do you know, Colin, that it's impossible to integrate two stock exchanges? Why? Because every stock market uses different messaging systems. So the messaging system of of Stripe that we use SWIFT, it's difficult to integrate with, for example, the messaging system of the London Stock Exchange that we tried, but we failed. Like everybody has tried to integrate uh, financial market infrastructures, and it never was possible. Now we have a system that is built with standards that is open source for everybody to integrate. So the word that I love this word is called composability. Composability means that you take one protocol in DeFi and another protocol open source, and you can combine them to create any other protocol that you want to create in your imagination. That- right, let's, but before we go into that, let's, let's, yeah. you start, you started talking about um, DeFi. So let's, let's dig straight into deep. So the, so let, okay, I'm bought. The monetary side of things sounds cool. Um, whether it be Bitcoin, Ethereum, 
a mixture, some other crypto, whether it's going to be a stable coin from a JP Morgan or even a government backed digital coin. Crypto based coins are here to stay one way or another. <laughs> Wild West as to which one is the one to put your money on. But that's for investors and uh, people that like betting to go and think about. I also get the sense that um, transactionally it's coming because we're moving away from this uh, proof of work and there are new models. We've got Lightning sitting on top of some of these protocols as well. So the speed is starting to improve. The energy is getting better. The regulations coming and a lot of countries are moving forward into it. That's just one part, though, because there's another set of people that are saying um, a good way to describe blockchain is to look upon this as a new almost as a new computer, as a new comp you know, coding language. And therefore, when we start now thinking about the other aspects, Web 3.0 and how this can go into, you know, virtual worlds and smart contracts, and it's almost an operating system that's being created. And the first operating system user case that seems to be popular is decentralized finance. Can you explain what decentralized finance is? Yeah. It's, um, for me, it's something that um, I am in shock of the beauty of this DeFi. What is DeFi? Simply, yeah, really, it's beautiful to watch it. Now, coming from traditional finance, the, 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 it's exactly the opposite. I'll give you an example. I, first of all, let me define. Decentralized finance is simply a smart contract. Okay? So what is a smart contract? If this happens, therefore that happens. It's like a vending machine. When you go and buy a chocolate, it says, press B1, put 10 rand. You don't argue with the machine. You press B1, press it, put the money, the, the chocolate drop. Finish on class. Let's this let's use a, a simple example. Let's let's try to do this. Yeah. Where we, we've got a hundred odd people on the call. Let's imagine that we're all part of a, a network in some way. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kick things yeah. off with this idea. Um, yeah. I want to go and lend some um, yes. coins to you, Monica, and I want it yes. to be over yes. three days. Um, and I'd like to, um, I don't know what the rate should be, but I believe that we could put a decentralized finance contract together, which everyone is going to be interested in to go and create a marketplace. That's correct. So, for example, you should look at Aave. So, Aave is one of the most famous decentralized finance protocols where you can go in and you put your uh, crypto. And let's, let's assume I've got crypto. Okay. I don't want to sell it. Remember, normally if you have crypto, you hold for the long term, because if Bitcoin got to $66,000 and today is 20, the potential for increase in value is huge. So who would be so stupid to go and buy pizza today with Bitcoin? With respect to um, pick and pay, that's now allowing you know, the use of Bitcoin to buy bread, I would never use my Bitcoins to buy bread, for example, because I see it more as a store of value. But in future, other tokens and other types of coins will come through that will be more a medium of exchange and a unit of account, for example. But the point is that um, if I want to lend my, so then I've got my crypto. I need fiat now to pay my rent. So what do I do? I go to Aave, I put my, I lend my crypto, but remember they will ask me, let's assume that I want to have a loan for 100,000 100, uh, rand, so I'm going to have to uh, put, they're going to give me 100,000 Rand, but I'm going to have to put more collateral. My crypto, the value of the crypto has to be higher than the loan they gave me. So imagine that instead of the banking system today, when you ask for a loan, they do, a, they do an analysis of you as an individual, who you are, where you live, how much you earn. They ask you all these questions. They KYC you, they... You know, they even do an X-ray of your body. I don't know to give you some money. In the in the in the DeFi world, it doesn't matter who you are. What's your name? Where do you live? Do you have a job? Nobody cares. The only thing they want is: Have you got enough collateral to protect the credit risk of the loan they're giving you? Do you understand? And, and it's all electronically. It's all recorded. You can follow your loan. It's all decentralized. And that should not be confused with, for example, companies like Celsius, that was a centralized finance um, company where people gave them the money and the money wasn't going to where it should go because it was centralized. Remember, we're trying to decentralize in a blockchain so that you can follow the money and make sure that nobody's stealing your money. So Aave is one of the you know, DeFi protocols that are really successful. And you know, 
it's amazing to watch how these crypto funds can actually uh, displace a bank. Because why would you go to a bank when getting a loan is so difficult when you could save your money in crypto and then when you need fiat, you go to a DeFi protocol, get the money, get the loan. And then even if you, um, you want to, let, uh, it's not only uh, borrowing, you can lend the money to the protocol and then earn an amazing yield that was not possible in the past. So there are many ways to earn a passive income when you use your DeFi protocol. You just need to know what to do. And that's well, there, there you've hit the nail on the head, haven't you, Monica? Because yeah. it's a bit of a wild west, isn't it? Because there's so mm. many, um, mm. I mean, there must be about tens of thousands of yeah. projects, yeah. inverted commas, yeah. that are being set up and advertised yeah. who are encouraging people to go and convert their dollars into a variety of cryptos to now participate in this ecosystem, usually with guarantees of, you know, 20 25 percent returns on that particular token and the way those returns are generated are coming in all sorts of of different ways it could be relating to underlying investments it could be you know gas fees for doing projects and working together it could be lending between you know different organizations it could be collateral arrangements there's so many different ways that people are being encouraged yeah. um to invest money investing money to en yeah. encourage coders to go and build out you know games yeah. which are then going to get released which will have more people investing in and you're going to get yeah. your money back and yet so many of them are not worth the uh, the marketing material everyone is putting a white paper out and saying this is you know that how how do you navigate this and end up finding quality um and that organization is the wrong word quality decentralized finance projects where you're not going to have your shirt taken from you so i give you an example one of the companies that consensus runs is called a consensus diligence just remember that the protocols are a smart contract so what consensus diligence does is that we audit the smart contract and then we produce a report that gets published in the in the, in the website of the protocol so you should be able to have enough information to audit based on the information you've been given from the auditors, whether or not this uh, smart contract is complying with the, all the risk management processes that should be in place. So you need to do your homework. And also they say that the more decentralized, the better. The longer that that protocol has existed, the better. So the other thing that consensus has done, knowing that this is very complicated, this is not for the uninitiated. This is, you know, if you download, for example, your MetaMask, uh, which is a self-custody wallet, and you start trading on DeFi, it's quite complicated. And therefore, what we've done is we produce a um, tool called MetaMask for Institution. So I love my bank taking care of me. I go to the bank and I said, could you please invest all these funds in, a, in a DeFi protocols that are going to give me a return of X? So with these two MetaMask for institutions, it has all the controls built in. It has reports, it has data, it has risk management, KYC, um, integration to different types of payments. So this is for institutions to invest in DeFi on behalf of clients. So more and more of this um, user experience will become easier to use because you don't need to know what's behind it. You just need to make sure that the smart contract is not hackable, remember? That's the biggest risk in DeFi. The biggest risk is that the smart contract has been written in a vulnerable way and some you know, bad player then runs away with your money. Or worse, we have the concept of rag pool, rag pool which is, the creators of the smart contract, they tell you, come and join us. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, after they have enough money, they run away with your money. So you need to know and do your homework and make sure that someone has audited it to make sure that all these controls are in place. And let's be honest, you cannot have real-time access to your bank's financial statements. You can hardly see what the auditors are saying once a year about the bank. We have even seen how bank failures take place where, for example, BBS was completely abused by the auditors, by the management, and the poor regulators were getting these audited reports that were not true. And they, were, they thought that they were regulating the bank when the bank was full of 
the absolute fraud. So here now we have a new way of implementing traditional finance that is DeFi, is, is permissionless, is frictionless, is transparent, is public. You just need to know how to navigate and it's complicated. So if you do not know how to do it, then you will go to institutions that will then specialize in looking after you, um, you know, um, in terms of uh, the DeFi opportunities, which are many, many. And that's that's good news. And we're starting to see numbers of institutions, you know, it's not just yours and Cyber are getting involved as well. Um, I was looking at A16Z are doing some great work, obviously, with Andreessen um, in terms of supporting the uh, DAO ecosystems. And these are great places to go uh, to have a look. But um, let's just answer a couple of these um, quickly. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we're we're looking for quick answers, Monica, because I want to get okay, into this okay. video and yeah. understand how uh, what leadership teams should be doing now. First one from Cantilal is why is Bitcoin price dropped so drastically? The answer must be don't know supply and demand. Should we go on to the next question? <laughs> and the macro um, reality of what we're going through at the moment in the world. Hello, you know. Okay, Rob Jackson, do you see the country? imposed forex limitations being removed i don't think that's related to bitcoin per se is there anything you'd like to say on that before we move on no, Thanks for the I question, don't, yeah i don't think so the opposite uh, because remember forex at the moment foreign exchange rules are mainly based on transparency of where the money's going yes there are certain limits but they're quite you know uh, able to if you want to take 10 million rand you can but the uh, reserve bank wants to know where the money is going and where it's coming from. So they will have in this technology more transparency to actually monitor where the money goes. So that will carry on uh, being in existence. Longer's question is an interesting one. How do you directly invest in blockchains? I'm not sure that <laughs> there's so many answers for that. Do you want to give it a go? First to explain. Blockchain is the technology that records the ledger. So every single token that we talk about in, in DeFi and in, in, in any of the solutions in this uh, Web 3.0 are using blockchain technology. So let's not get confused. It's, it's like the ledger. Every single company in the world that produces financial statements has to have a ledger. But it's centralized, it's silo, it's under the control of the financial director and the shareholders. This is uh, open, transparent. You can choose if you want in the permissionless ecosystem or the permission one, which is an intranet. So let's not confuse. And therefore, you, you need to decide what pain points does that project is resolving. Is blockchain technology suitable for the pain point that you want to utilize, do you need open, transparent, permissionless, less cost, less you know, friction, or the current central database is serving the purpose that you need? So, so it's not about blockchain, it's about the pain point that it's been trying to resolve. All right, um, let's just have a look at this DAO model, because I want to, to think about the disruption that's potentially coming to not just financial services, but industries in general. Can you explain this idea of a decentralized autonomous organization? Because there's a conflict here. People are still building and writing the code. They're still developing projects. They're still collaborating with each other in the same way any organization would. So let's make up an example. A company comes along and says, I don't know, um, we're going to create, we'll use your example. We're going to create this method for for collateralization people who've got coins you know they've got bitcoin or they've got ether or they've got anyone or they've got uh, dogecoin um but they need dollars because they want to buy a house we're going to set up this collateralized decentralized finance and i want to use the word company right where we've got to market it we've got to advertise it we've got to have a on-ramp where people can engage with us there has to be help desks there's got to be documentation there's got to be so all the normal things and yet it's a dao how does that work okay so first of all the the dao doesn't have buildings shareholders minute books board of directors employees actually so what the dao is just imagine 
the decentralized finance protocol, many of them are uh, structured in a DAO. So DAOs are going to replace limited liability companies. Why? Because what you That's have- That's a big statement. Let's just pause on that before you say why. The prediction is DAOs are going to replace limited liability companies. Limited liability companies, the design of that was probably the biggest business development you know, what is it, hundred, you know, those hundreds of years back yeah. with the uh, India trading companies, yeah. which allowed risk to be diversified so that people yeah. could invest and, and participate. I mean, that's a massive statement. I know, but that's exactly what is happening. And the whole idea is that instead of having, yes, uh, you know, with power comes responsibility, which means that in the limited liability company, you have the centralization of that legal entity that gets approved by the register of companies, then you have the shareholders, the board, the employees, the hierarchy, and the silos. And certain people can participate depending on the, you know, the rules of the, you know, articles of association and their purpose, blah, 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 very centralized. In the DAO, what happens is that you create this smart contract, okay, and then you announce in Discord or Reddit saying the objectives of this smart contract that I'm about to launch is because I want to save the whales, you know? So anybody that wants to come and save the whales, we are going to put a chip on the whales that we see and we're gonna monitor them. And every whale will be tokenized. And I'm inventing this for effect. So every mm -hmm. whale, not because I love whales, I live across the ocean, so I look at the whale. So every whale that is tokenized will have a, um, a recognized address and everybody will be able to see where the whales go and we will be able to have, let's say, if you belong to the DAO, you will be able to participate in, in going into the ocean with me and, 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 you know, meaning I create a community to understand the difference. And if I want to, if I love the whales, I'm going to say, oh, in my spare time, I'm going to be a programmer and I'm going to contribute code so that we can record the whales in a better way. And I will choose if I want to get paid or not. And the way that the DAO normally pays you is through tokens. So can you see that now you're working for a DAO that you didn't have to apply for a job, you didn't have to have an interview, you just go into the protocol and start programming because it's open source. And then you get the benefit of getting a token or you get the benefit of participating in, let's say, events, you know, come and, you know, a party of all the whale watchers in the world that are part of the DAO, you are now going to have the ability to come to this party and you're going to have swag and we're going to give you tokens. So can you understand the freedom that you can work for them? There's no buildings, there's no legal structure in reality. It's just a group of people that participate voluntarily. What can I do with these tokens, though, Monica? I ah. still need to pay for my uh, my my food and buy a house and yes, you know yes. uh, these sorts Good of things. Point. And these tokens are valueless. No, 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 no. Uh, if you if you take a token a token from Uniswap or Aave or whatever, they're not valueless. These um, protocols, as people are using them, they're becoming more and more um, useful. So that means that the the employee that is working as a programmer is getting paid on tokens and can go into the market and use those tokens to, let's say, collateralize a loan that they're going to get into in fiat. So just remember that everything is interoperable. So a token in Uniswap can be used for a loan with that Aave, for example. Well, let's, let's, let's just pause on, um, on that one. That's the aim, isn't it, that they become interoperable, but we're not quite there yet. There's still a fair amount of complexity, um, complex, complexity to go from token to token to, to bot, you know, to ether to across these different chains. Yeah. This is where I, going back to one of the questions. We're really hoping this zero knowledge proof starts to become mm. um, something important. And I think it was a question earlier from uh, Nanda who's asked about zero knowledge proofs or um, ZK snarks, which I've never heard of. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's coming, especially in Ethereum as a layer one. It's going to increase the ability to have more volume. Plus, remember, the other obsession is in an open source blockchain, how do you achieve privacy? So we are creating new structures to prevent everything from being so transparent, because as yeah. you know, 
uh, if you've got a central bank digital currency, you don't want everybody to know when you go to a prostitution place, you know, if you want to pay with CBDCs, why should the central bank know that I went to a prostitution place? Or if I'm gambling or drinking alcohol, that should be my responsibility and not for the central bank to know. So we still have to have a, a balance between anonymity and privacy. So that I think is part of the evolution of what's going on. But going back to the DAO, the main thing is the freedom to choose where you're gonna work, who you're gonna participate, and you're going to align yourself to the values of that uh, uh, protocol, and you participate when you want to, and you will get out when you want to. So, so it's a great question from Zwakeli there, saying, is this only useful for social initiatives? I mean, it's great to be out there saving the whales and doing what you can and mm -hmm. maybe designing this uh, tracking mechanism, but what about um, real business, which generates you know productive solutions that we're used to paying for in, in dollars? Okay. so. If you, I want everybody to look at Uniswap. Let's stop talking about that. I mean, let's look at you about Uniswap. For me, Uniswap is incredible. Why? Because Uniswap, it's an automate, automated market maker. So with Uniswap, you go in and without asking permission, and you put a token and you say, I want to exchange my token for a different token. And Uniswap does exactly that. It's a smart contract. If this happens, therefore that happens. You know that Uniswap volumes were higher than Coinbase. Coinbase needed to be listed with all the cost of listing, with all the cost of regulation. Uniswap is a DAO. It's a DAO. There's no listing, there's no buildings, there's hardly no people because it's a smart contract. And the tokens are very valuable. So can you see uh, that's a real life application of um, DeFi and, and a DAO? And there are many more. I can give you a lecture just on this. <laughs> Do you think this is going to actually uh, challenge the incumbents? There's another question here, which we can tie that into um, <laughs> from Stuart about decentralized crypto exchanges. But when, when, let's assume it's when and not if, when the infrastructure continues to be developed, the interoperability, zero proofs are kicking in, the speed, the regulations, you know, let's say in the next four or five years, maybe this next decade. Let's say the next four or five years. Do you think DAOs will start to disrupt limited liability companies to the extent that they actually start to replace them? Or is that fanciful? And is it the same across different industries as well, I suppose, as a second? So we've got exchanges were mentioned. Could be banks. It could be assurers. It could be supply chain management. It could be Microsoft or organizations that produce products, you know, digital products with code. Where does it stop? I can tell you that I have no doubt, in the same way that I predicted when I left straight, that the problem with the stock market will be that the issuers are going to start delisting from traditional stock exchanges because they're going to realize that they were stuck in a silo of the JSC, which is regulated in South Africa using the RAN, when you could actually go into a DAO in a DeFi environment and get liquidity from anywhere in the world in any type of currency, you can see in five years ago, there were 600 and something listed companies. Today in the JC, there's hardly 300 and something listed companies and those companies will carry on delisting. And that is the biggest problem for traditional finance that as people start understanding this technology, they're going to vote with a feet. So for example, here you've got Uniswap competing with the traditional stock market. You have Aave competing with the banking system. You have um, uh, market makers completely decimated by this uh, protocol. You have custodians. The, the banks were custody uh, shares and whatever. Now you have a uh, complete independent custodians that are housed in a DAO. So in, in this open uh, protocol, so can you see that the world is completely being replaced. And that's why last week, just last week, we saw uh, JP Morgan taking a tradi traditional financial instrument and using it to be, to they tokenize the instrument and they actually use it as collateral in the Aave protocol. So that's what we see more and more, the, the traditional assets like equities, bonds, money market instruments being tokenized and now being used in the DeFi uh, protocol. And that's the next evolution. 
Marius, welcome, welcome back. I thought, I suppose, my question, which I said I wanted to make sure we cover at the, the start, is what do business leaders need to do now? So one view is this is all a flash in the pan; it's going nowhere. Web three point zero, yeah. So we can keep our heads in the sand. You clearly don't advise that, Monica. What do you think that business leaders across all the different industries should be doing? Whatever it is, supplies, factories, you know, deliveries, production, manufacturing, services, banking. What should leaders be doing? Are you asking me? Oh, yeah, I, thought, I think I'm going to ask Marius for that one as well. Okay. It's about time we put you in the hot seat, Marius. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if I can jump in, I think I, I think we as business leaders would be foolish to ignore what's happening in the world. Um, you know, as, as usual, um, what do they say? Um, change start happening uh, slow and then sudden, you know. <clears throat> so there's, there's a ramp up and then it's going to be sudden. But I think, Monica, in terms of the, the kind of things that I'm just thinking about as you're speaking is the way that we as an organization would operate going forward. Um, just in terms of the way that we think about people that works for us. Um, you know, currently it's very traditional. We employ people, we pay them a salary. We're already starting to see people that say, well, I, I, need, it. I need some code to be developed. I put it out into the marketplace and, and people will develop it. So... I think what some of the, my takeaways is that we're going to go into a place where we have no one that works for us, but lots of people contributing to what we do <clears throat> um, going forward. So I think, uh, you know, one would be foolish to ignore the, 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 the trends coming. I guess my question to you is, how long do you think it will take before we see some of these things becoming pervasive? I mean, I, I don't think the blockchain is really the relevant conversation. That's just the enabling technologies. I think it's the ways of working that is going to radically change. And then if you don't embrace it, you'll become irrelevant. Totally agree. You know, this is one thing that I call it the, the, the gradual, 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 and then sudden. Yeah. So in the background, there are so many hundreds of companies working in, in, in creating the solutions. And, you know, once it's done, you know, you're going to hear, we launch. And therefore, those that do nothing, what I'm very scared of, Marius, is that this technology is so different from anything we've, we've learned today. You know, it will change the syllabus of becoming a chartered accountant, the syllabus of being a lawyer, contract law, what do you need? It will have massive implications. And therefore, I don't believe, like some companies are doing, that they should just create a little team that looks at studying this. It's like me saying to you, do you only have a little team that knows how to use email or does everybody learn how to use email? This is just an evolution of the email. It's internet of value. Everybody should be learning and studying and getting equipped. And you don't have to learn about everything. Learn about what is your area that affects you. So people that work for cyber and should be looking at anything to do with money. Uh, anybody working in supply chain should study blockchain for supply chain. If I work for um, a music company, uh, if I work for Spotify, I should be looking at NFTs and how NFTs might uh, disrupt Spotify, who disrupted the CD industry, and so forth and so forth. This is going to become ubiquitous, and therefore I'm, I'm imploring everybody to not only study, because this is it's like in, uh, the emails, you, you don't study emails, you do emails. And therefore I'm saying, download a, a wallet like MetaMask, learn how to use it, little money, don't risk it. And then by using it, I think that people will start understanding the incredible power of this technology. But we need to do more of these seminars so, to make sure that people start getting all the confusion of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, DAOs, decentralized finance, non-fungible tokens, but 3.0. All these new terms, it's very complicated. So I hope that today I was able to enlighten people in simple language as to how all this is going to work. Monica, thank you very much. Marius. Um, yes, thank you, Colin and Monica. Um, I think it was an excellent session. I think, uh, Monica, you're right. I think we need to have more of these. You know, maybe break it down and tackle one topic at a time <clears throat> because it is so broad. 
Um, but thank you for your time, Monica. We really thank appreciate you. it. And to you, Colin, um, for your time again today. And for everyone that was on the call, uh, we will try to um, answer some of those questions um, either on the LinkedIn site, so have a view there. I think the recordings will also be available if you want to go and uh, have a, a, uh, another look at the session. Um, but yeah, um, everyone have a splendid day. And once again, thank you for all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to oh, oh, Sorry, Monica. <laughs> what That's was okay. the track that I played? Dazed and confused by Led Zeppelin. I think I've come out <laughs> uh, feeling exactly that. But at least uh, from your perspective, I hope it's giving you some ideas so about where to look. We will try to answer those questions and respond back. And otherwise, we'll see you in the new year. Monica, thank you, Marius. Thank you for sponsoring you, these Marius. events. Everyone, thank have you, a great Colin. break in December and through into the new year. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.